to everyone whenever ever you are connecting in from. So thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, we are just waiting for the bulk of the audience to connect in. And in the meantime, feel free to grab some drinks or some snacks you know, before we start the actual webinar. All right, all right. Once again, good morning and good afternoon and good evening to everyone tuning in. And welcome to our webinar today, where our goal in this session is to introduce to people any ideas that can help you map Web3 to your business. So I'm Joel from E27, and this is Revolutionizing Your Business. So, you know, uh, thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, perhaps you can let us know where you are connecting in from. So I'm connecting in from the Philippines. You know, it's a really cozy weather here right now. And yeah, welcome to our webinar today. So, you know, actually coming into this webinar, I was actually thinking of What's the difference between Web3 and Web2? And then that's when I started to realize that the, the difference between Web3 and Web2 is one. Get it? Get it? Because three minus two is one. So anyway, so together with our friends at Didoco, we have invited some of the most amazing thought leaders to share their insights on how Web3 can help you transform your business and open up new opportunities. But you know, I will save the details of this discussion to our panelists later on. Now, before we start, let's just go over a few house rules. So the first one is, oh, let me skip this one. So the first one is, first, do note that this is a panel discussion and we would like to invite you to join by sharing your thoughts and comments on the topic in the chat widget below. Second one is, the floor is always open to your questions. So do share your questions in the Q&A widget and we will get back to it so the panelists can address them at the end of the discussion. And lastly, with the first two halls in mind, please know that this webinar is recorded and will be shared with all of you via email so you can view them after. Now, before we dive into it, we actually want to get to know you more, you know. We'll be launching a poll on your screen to help us get a sense of where you are coming from. So let me just quickly launch this. Okay. There you go. Okay, so we have two questions there. So the first one is, is your organization already utilizing Web3 technologies? So, you know, coming into this webinar, I think it's really important to know whether your company or your business or your corporate is already utilizing Web3, or, you know, whether you are doing it already, you are working on it, or you have no plans on utilizing Web3 as of the moment. Yeah, so please share your insights with us in the poll on your screen. The second question is, what are some of the challenges that you are currently facing or anticipating? You no, know, especially since Web3, you know, is a really new technology in most people. I think it's really important to anticipate or, you know, prepare for any certain setbacks or challenges that you might, we might face, you know, in applying this technology to our company. So we have security, development complexity, scalability, interoperability, hardware, and others. So I do see that people are actually answering others. So if you could let us know um, what are some of the challenges that you are facing in the chat, that would be great. So perhaps we can share it with the panelists later on as well. And yes, we'll keep the polls open for a few more seconds. Yeah, so for the first one, I think there are a lot of people who are not yet incorporating Web3, but are planning to. And closing the polls in three, two, one. Okay, so let me share the poll results so you actually get a sense of who are connecting here as well. So for the first one, I think that more people are, you know, are planning to utilize Web3. There are people who are who don't have any plans. So perhaps you can let us know in the chat, you know, during the panel discussion on why you don't have any plans. Or maybe we can touch on, you know, on some of the things that can possibly change your mind. So for the second question, yeah, I think the most selected answer is security. Wow, I think a lot of people answered this one. So if you can share with us in the chat as well, why you think it's one of the most challenging or one of the challenges that you're anticipating, yeah, would we get to let us know as well. Okay, let me just stop sharing this. And 
Okay, so now that we have all of that out of the way, I would like to turn over the floor to our panelists and the moderator. So the person I would like to introduce is Jason Williamson. So Jason is the Director of Growth and Partnerships for Didoco. So Didoco is an API-first digital document management as a service that seamlessly transforms the way enterprises manage digital workflows and deliver digital trust within their operations. So Jason, welcome, welcome. Thanks, Joel. Thank you for having me. Uh, that was a very good and concise intro. Um, yeah, and a very good uh, summary of the company as well. Uh, for those of you who don't know Dodoco or haven't come across us, we're, we're Singapore HQ, uh, and our current focus really is serving the kind of Southeast Asia and kind of greater APAC market with our solution. Uh, and I guess for the context of this conversation, uh, we are very much powered by Web3 technologies, uh, even though a lot of our partners and customers are traditional, uh, yeah, traditional industry uh, and Web2 companies, uh, we really, like, our aim is to bring kind of the Web3 technologies to partners who are currently utilizing Web2 technology. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that, Jason. And next is we have Richard Cole. So Richard is the Chief Technology Officer of Microsoft Singapore, and he is responsible for engaging with key executive leaders across government, industries, and academia, bringing in the macro technology landscape and helping customers leverage technology innovations for their digital transformation. So Richard, a pleasure to have you here as well. Hey, Lawes, Joe. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me and thanks for uh, taking on Microsoft in this. This is a really exciting topic. So uh, we're really looking forward to the discussion. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here as well, Richard. And next, uh, the very last panelist we have. So we would like to call on Lauren the Dennis. So Lauren is the CEO and co-founder of Chainstack and the CEO of Alamira. So he has more than 20 years of global experience managing teams and technology companies such as Microsoft Dynamics, Parallels, Acumatica, and Acronis, both at startups and growth stages in the Americas, Europe, Middle East, and Africa, and the Asia Pacific. So once again, Lauren, a pleasure to have you here. Well, and thank you very much for the introduction, and i um, very pleased to be uh, in very good company for this panel and this discussion. I'm definitely looking forward to engaging with, um, with all of you guys and potentially answering questions if uh, that can help. Um, very briefly, uh, Chainstack is also headquartered uh, in Singapore, where global company, we're close to 100 people now. And, and basically, the problem we solve is the complexity of running uh, blockchain um, in general and Web3 application in particular. And uh, uh, we have uh, thousands of, of developers using our solution today around the world. And uh, the idea of uh, uh, me bringing to this discussion, uh, Chainstack, is, is basically to explain some of the challenges we see, but also some of the opportunity we see in the market. Well, thank you. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that one as well, Lauren. And yeah, so let me now, you know, very last, but definitely not the least, so our moderator today, Thaddeus Go. So Thaddeus is an NUS Overseas College Silicon Valley alumni, where he worked at a startup called Catapora and received this minor in technopreneurship at the Stanford Center for Professional Development. So part of his passion is enabling Southeast Asian startups to succeed online through, strength, through the strength of E27's community and platform. And now, Thaddeus has been personally diving deep into Web3, especially in DAOs, crypto, and a little bit of NFTs. So please help me in welcoming our moderator for today, the co-founder of E27 himself, Thaddeus Ko. Hey, hey, hi. Hi, everyone. Hey, thanks, uh, Joel, for the introduction. Um, yeah, so for E27, yes, um, Traditionally, we've been uh, covering the Web2 space, uh, especially on the media and the, the event side of things. But um, I think we can no longer ignore that the powerful movement of Web3. Uh, and that's why we are actively uh, covering Web3-related investment uh, opportunities, uh, events, activities, and of course, having a great opportunity to work with key partners like, like you guys and the panelists here today to bring more information and insights uh, for our community. Yeah, back to you, uh, Joel. Mm. Yeah, awesome. So I think uh, pretty much we have all of our panels and the moderator here. So that's all on my end. So yeah, that is, uh, feel free to take the floor. All right, right. We thanks, uh, thanks, Joel. So so I think we the poll was great actually. The bro the poll actually pointed out some areas that we can focus on later to try to answer some of these questions that you guys might have. Uh, we have about forty minutes, and I think we just want to give. Uh, a little bit of uh, overview of the Web3 uh, opportunities today. And uh, just uh, a more open-ended question to the, to Jason first, like where are the opportunities in Web3? You know, where do you all see it? 
and uh, something that you can share with the audience today, which is predominantly Web2 related uh, tech founders, companies, business owners. Yeah. Sure. Jason? Um, so there's probably three things that always kind of come to mind when I think of this, when it comes to or any company we speak to uh, kind of want to talk about the opportunity with Web3. Um, the first one really is about uh, access of different customer bases and the access to fun, like services and products that are available. Uh, and one thing that has traditionally always been the case is that we've not been able to, or inclusion has always been an issue of getting people who have financial services who are then able to kind of uh, kind of yeah, participate within markets. And the web, the way Web three is structured, and the kind of growth of the cryptocurrency kind of movement, which is probably where everybody has had that taste of of, of Web three technology, it really has allowed more people to contribute uh, and obviously participate in these markets. Uh, and I think we're seeing more and more now it's even going past just access on how you can pay for things. We're also yeah. looking at different ways that people's identity can be verified, for example. So it's, it's all a movement towards allowing people access. And I think for businesses who are thinking about, especially in kind of the market as it is at the moment, how do you reach new customers? Uh, and I think this, the Web3 technology and the kind of applications of it is a great way for businesses to start to think about growing their addressable markets. Mm -hmm. um, second one is kind of really about how companies build. Uh, and I think traditionally kind of everyone was building in silos that they had their own technology and they were building it independently of other partners. Uh, and what we're finding more and more with Web3 development is that it really is the partner ecosystem and the open source nature of the technology, which means that a lot of the work that people are doing is building upon existing applications or existing innovations and obviously customizing it and building it for the better, which can then be used again by another third party. Mm -hmm. So it's really you're never starting from day one when you're looking at opportunity in Web3 because a lot of the legwork has already been done in mm -hmm. building those core foundations. Uh, and the last one, I think, really is kind of more about the principles of Web3, about why kind of the technology and the way that decentralization has been kind of viewed as kind of how the future uh, mm. of yeah. not only business should be should be run, but more just kind of communities and society in general, is yeah. that it now gives us different ways that we can engage with customers and we can allow them to interact with the business. So we can kind of move people away from just being customers and we can kind of move them in closer to the business by giving them, whether it's decision-making power, whether it's giving mm. them access to information or services they weren't able to get before, it's kind of bridging that gap and bringing the customer closer to businesses. And yeah. here, I think, is one of the areas where we're going to see the most innovation. Yeah, uh, just to follow up on your point, uh, especially the last, last part, I think for the businesses here today, the startups here today, it might be a bit of a, a flip on the model where you really have to look at the customers and users as, as your community that you have to engage them and allow certain kind of decision making for them. That's kind of like where Web3 would, would work together with the Web2 type of models. Uh, but let's hear a little bit more from uh, our two other panelists. Uh, maybe I will go to Richard. Uh, from your perspective, especially from Microsoft, right? What are some of the larger opportunities that you guys see? Yeah, if you can share. Uh, thanks, thanks, Dennis. I think that's a great question. I think uh, Jason opened up really nicely. I, I, I think when we think about uh, you know this space itself, I, I think a lot of the let's say uh, frictions and concerns right now is around, um, it's, it's around let's say content and identity and things like that that the uh, persons own right the data and uh, the information itself, and and how portable is that across let's say different platforms in the web two world itself. So um, from a Microsoft perspective, uh, we've been working on a decentralized identity um, approach uh, with, with um, Microsoft Entra. And, and when we think about this, I, I think this is, this is where that uh, individual aspect of uh, Web3 really comes in and is mm -hmm. for content creators. I mean, when you think about, uh, you know, when I think about my son playing games uh, on, mm -hmm. on certain platforms or a certain uh, gaming ecosystem, and then they have attained a certain uh, certain status and all of that. But when they leave the platform, that's it. Yeah, it, yeah. It's it's left with the platform itself. So so that kind of uh, that kind of let's say asset status uh, credentials that you have you have grown uh, mm -hmm. if you have nurtured over a certain period of time. 
how interoperable is it to bring to another ecosystem, to another platform itself, such that uh, the notion around ownership itself, ownership, yeah. not tied to the individual itself. So I, I think that's that's um, that's bringing in some ways back the spirit of uh, how the internet was invented in in many ways yeah. uh, from that decentralized model. So it's really exciting to see some of the thinking in the space and some of the technology that's in, um, is it's emerging in this space. I think from a Microsoft perspective. We're, we're, we're very focused on uh, some of the aspects around identity and around security. Um, and, and this is some of the things that uh, we believe that uh, from a company perspective, this is where we have um, you know, some of that uh, strength in and uh, yeah. are looking forward to contributing some of that tools and platforms out there for, for the community as well. Yeah, um, as, a, as a media company ourselves actually, uh, more than half of our content actually contributed by our community. Mm. I think we are, uh, that's why we are excited about this space is we're looking at ways to pass ownership of mm -hmm. the content and incentive of that content, the, whatever it generates. At some point in time, we want to see, okay, how do we bring them into the fold, right? Although they're not employees of the company, but how do we adopt some of these models such that it makes sense, such that they're more driven, more motivated to contribute mm. and providing more insights and information to our community. Mm. So I think that's the beauty of that, 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 that ownership model that we are also looking at. Uh, last but not least, uh, let's hear from Lauren as well. What, where do you think, or from your perspective, where do you see some of the opportunities today for Web3? Right. <clears throat> Thanks. So uh, I think what's, um, what's interesting about Web3 in general is that um, this market and this industry has developed in parallel to, um, to the existing IT industry, which means that you have um, an existing today uh, Web3 ecosystem and stack, uh, which is already fairly powerful, um, whether it's uh, uh, millions or billions um, worth of value in terms of software and technology and innovation does not really matter. But there is an entire ecosystem that is being built and is already fairly mature within the Web3 space. And that's one opportunity. I'll come back to that briefly. And um, of course, the second opportunity is how what we traditionally call Web2 companies that Jason and, and Richard uh, explain mm -hmm. um, in, in more detail, um, will basically adapt what's being done and, and how they will like, potentially disrupt um, their current processes in order to move some of their processes, probably not all, to some of the Web3 mm -hmm. um, um, industry specifics and vertical whenever it makes sense. Mm -hmm. In the Web3 space today, uh, you have uh, probably eight or nine um, different verticals that are already fairly mature. Uh, I'm sure most of you um, are aware of those. Um, DeFi is decentralized finance. It's certainly mm -hmm. one of the largest ones. Uh, today, you've got uh, wallets, uh, decentralized exchange, centralized exchanges, uh, trading, um, arbitrage, uh, staking companies uh, that are already significant. Um, and that provides you know solution for uh, B2C and their customer that you know generate billions of transaction and requests and, and basically create value. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably the largest portion of, of the web tree that we call today. But you also find uh, development companies, of course, I'm sure everyone knows NFTs. Um, going back to Richard Point, uh, I think you have an entire ecosystem around governance and uh, of course. Uh, identity, uh, which is very key and, and which is already fairly big. I mean, you find all sorts of DAO, uh, voting companies, funding companies uh, that organize or imagine how decentralized governance could actually function, which are mm. interesting. Uh, you've got retail company, and then you've got a lot of infrastructure company that basically help to run Web3, right? Identity, Web3 domain, distributed computing, um, analytics that helps um, all those companies building with on-chain analysis and Oracle analysis that, that are very key. And then you have the protocol, right? The, the stack, um, you know, all of them, all of you guys know uh, Ethereum and, and some of the largest uh, public blockchain, but also private permission blockchain that operates within the Web2 space as well. Mm -hmm. And this ecosystem, and my point in, in mentioning all those different categories and subcategories is already existing. Uh, and, and I think the challenge now and the opportunity is for some of the Web2 companies that, that believe in Web3 model or that have processes that 
you know, could benefit from Web3 processes, which is decentralization, certain level of transparency, but potentially better auditability, a better management of ID and, and mm. sovereign identity. Yeah. Can actually pick and choose from those existing verticals, right? DeFi, NFT, governance, retail, analytics, etc. But they can also come and disrupt this further by adapting some of their current process and trying to improve them and enhance them from what they are. And mm-hmm. I think that's really the opportunity for web two companies. Well, um, just a, this is a best way for for us to transition to uh, my next point, right? Which is we all know right now there's a bad economy and there's a crypto winter as well. I just want to address this as well. Would would this be the best opportunity to 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 start on that, Lauren? To really seriously find a team to adopt the technology, to build on top of it, to understand the concepts that we have. We are we are going to discuss later. Would you think that this is the best time to do this? Yeah, I, I think it's the best time and it has nothing to do with, with Web3. I mean, history is telling us. I think it's Jason or Richard that was you know, mentioning what happened during the dot com, the dot com, um, you know, at the end of the at the end of the year two thousand, and and we know that typically a difficult time are best time for a software company to revamp and build, yeah. right? And, yeah. and what we observe at our small level at Chainstack today, in terms of net new number of developer coming, you know, from different space, you know, Microsoft developer, traditional developer, mobile application developers that are just jumping into Web3 because they want to understand the type of solution they want to build and, uh, and, and, and how they can actually contribute to, uh, to this, um, I'm going to say revolution, I think it's a bit strong, <laughs> but they want to, to understand how they can actually contribute to this process and whether there is uh, something interesting in Web3. We, we welcome hundreds of net new developer every month on, on the platform and they all interested in disrupting one of the verticals that I, that I just mentioned. So mm-hmm. of course it's the best time to build and you have a lot of very strong uh, companies and projects out there um, that are building amazing solutions, including protocol and every level of the stack. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's see a bit more from Jason and, and Richard on this point. Like, is this the best time to start? Yeah. I'll I leave you start. Uh, go ahead, uh, uh, Richard or Jason. Yeah. Oh, you want me to go? Okay. Sure, 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 sure. Yeah, yeah. No problem. Um. So, so you know. Laurent really, really pointed that out, right? Like that dot-com bus. Uh, yeah, I happen to be in Silicon Valley living there when, when the whole thing just went south at that point in time. But but I, I think that that was an opportunity. And, and you know, if I may be a little bit more pro- uh, you know, provocative uh, in mm. this stage right now, I, I think we, 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 do have, we do have some, let's say, very big, challenges that uh, frankly the human race is dealing with yeah and if you think about the web 2 platforms where you know many of the companies and in, in, including ourselves as well right like we're building a lot of data centers around the world and all of that but think of that how how can we actually bring sustainability into the web 3 world itself and, and it's something that because of perhaps because of the timing right now and when all the different developers comes in it, it it, it, it's actually quite an opportunity to think about that, and, and you know, just think about just think about software code itself. Where uh, you know today, whether is it blockchains or anything like that, it's consuming a lot of electricity. We all know that. That's 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 a fact. Um, but if if we take a step back and then think about how does you know sustainability kind of impact. Uh, in the Web3 world, I, I think I haven't quite quite seen anything uh, specific like that, but certainly I think that could be one of those things that might emerge from this time itself and then say, how actually this, this, this uh, crypto winter, for, for example, can actually help us to really think about, you know, sustainability in a much more larger fashions um, across, across this whole entire, let's say, evolution of the internet itself. Yeah, I, I think that part is uh, also called to what we were thinking of uh, earlier in the year. We were, you know, there are two major topics this year at the start of this year. Mm-hmm. One is Web3, uh, following up from the NFT craze and all that. The other one is actually the, that, that sustained movement of sustainability related topics, right? It's something that important that we, we have to address is really, really under underserved in terms of information, in terms of technologies that's out there, startups trying to solve this and that. Um, but we struggle with that because um, of the regulations and things like that. 
But when we look at Web3, we find that, look, it's not just technology, but I think there's an element of that community-focused uh, decentralization models that could play a part in accessibility as well. Uh, hopefully, we have enough time to discuss some points in that. Um, any last ad, uh, uh, additional points from uh, Jason? Um, I, I would just say, kind of, if you're an organization who's thinking about whether this is a good time to build, um, I mean, yeah, I've always loved the, the kind of saying, creativity loves constraints. And I think naturally at the moment, kind of human instinct for businesses will be to kind of cut back on innovation and kind of double down on kind of core kind of parts of the business. And I think traditionally people assume that to innovate, you must have a lot of upfront expenditure to obviously yeah. bring the new technologies into a business or to integrate them in if they're already existing. Uh, and I would, I guess, challenge and kind of question whether with Web3 technologies, whether that is kind of that same mantra is really applicable. Um, mm -hmm. Mainly, I say that because a lot of the, like I said before, a lot of the work and the kind of the building blocks are already there for organizations to work with. But also, it's not a zero sum game. It's not a case of you must take your Web2 technologies, throw yeah. them out the window and implement mm -hmm. Web3 technologies. Yeah. It's an iterative process that we're already seeing the tools that will enable Web2 systems to speak to Web3 systems or applications. So there's actually a company in Singapore I came across recently who are like a Zapier, if you use that within your business. They, they can now do that across decentralized applications and traditional applications. Mm -hmm. so you can kind of take small steps, which again, whether that's innovation or transformation, or whatever you want to call it, it doesn't have to be something that is kind of yeah, a big capex cost to your business. It can be something that you can do iteratively but still be innovating in a time when I think a lot of people are probably looking. Yeah. You know, they yeah. will not see this area as a kind of where they want to put their money right now. Yeah. So for the 36% of you guys that say not yet, but we're planning to, according to the poll, please start looking into it because this, as our panelists have mentioned, right? And I just like to share, um, I think the uh, 2016 and 17, uh, uh, during the ICO and crypto phase, um, there were a lot of projects as well. Um, but I think, from, from my perspective, what has changed, right, is there are starting to have a lot of better user experience, UI even, uh, for you to interact with a lot of these Web3 models or technologies. And if it feels really like Web2. Uh, it's just, you just have to find it. The model of using it is a bit different, but nonetheless, right, it's a lot more familiar today compared to previously where uh, um, you do need some level of technical knowledge to access some of these tools previously. Um, so again, 36%, ask your questions. Where do you start? How do you start? We'll try to answer that later as well. Uh, let's move on to the next part, right? So, so um, this is the part that we wanted to start to go down a little bit deeper into Web3. I think we want to ask the question, right? Is Web3 really just about blockchain tech, right? Is there more to it? I think the panelists has mentioned a little bit about uh, uh, NFTs, uh, uh, decentralized models and all that. So I, I do want to... Um, Ask Jason first, right? Uh, what, what are some of the areas that you guys are looking at? I mean, blockchain tech is one. This is for sure. It's very clear on, on what you guys offer. But what are some of the other models that you guys are also taking into your company and applying it uh, to that solution that you guys are offering? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I think yeah, the issue with blockchain and has been over the last couple of years is that people kind of just, it's synonymous with everything that's going on in yeah. the web ecosystem. Yeah. So there's this kind of underlying assumption that a lot of the time it must be blockchain based if it's kind of within this ecosystem. But then also, I think even to its detriment, it's even been kind of piled in with cryptocurrency that people think when they hear cryptocurrency, a yeah. blockchain and then i mean i'd love to know from the people who have obviously mentioned security as an issue is that really because of the issues that people have seen around kind of exchange hacks yeah uh, yeah the scams and yeah yeah it, is it the issues that have been publicly av made available around that kind of application of technology or is it kind of the core business process that current organizations are using the technology for uh, so like supply chain for example is one where it's all about proving provenance of something and blockchain in itself is probably the perfect technology to ensure that you can track and trace things across a, a period of time and security issues there if anything it's the opposite they are built with security in mind and traceability and verifiability um so i think yeah to answer the question i think block I mean blockchain is always is in often cases kind of that entry point to a lot of the applications that you'll end up utilizing 
Um, but the decentralized piece, I think, especially from organizations that are looking at how they structure their organization, how they interact with customers, how they interact with partners, that's not necessarily has to be blockchain based. Mm-hmm. Uh, that can be something really about how you yeah, interact with uh, yeah, communities around kind of ensuring that you get feedback if you're going through a development process, that you get the community feedback, whether you're allowing access to different parties um, kind of based upon different identity uh, regimes. That doesn't have to be linked to a blockchain, but the technology in, in kind of 90% of the cases, it will be there, but really the benefit and what you're kind of experiencing really isn't kind of the blockchain experience. Yeah, yeah. So, we, um, uh, yeah, sorry, Jason. Yeah, and, and yeah, I mean, what we do at the Doco is very much kind of a yeah, testament to that is that we, you, companies that work with us, they receive the benefit of blockchain, but they don't really kind of feel kind of necessarily that, that is the primary reason why they use the platform. It is all about the benefits that they get from utilizing the technology. Mm. And it's mm. not only the blockchain part, it's the fact that they can verify their documents yep. without a third party being present. So yep. it's, all, it's all about the kind of, yeah, the applications of the technology can really kind of level up people's user experience. Yeah. But, but blockchain, yeah, is fundamentally kind of a core part of the majority of the applications out there at the moment. Yeah, yeah. So I hear also uh, transparency and decentralization, right? So uh, pointing this back into uh, to Richard or Lauren, uh, feel free to jump in. Uh, you guys have any opinion on on aspect of this uh, uh, transparency? Why is it important to uh, you know Web two business as an added question for them to consider? Uh, Richard, you want to take a shot at it? Okay, sure. Yeah, I I I agree with what you said. Just just highlight that. I think this this is great, right? When when you think about um the the the, the pro- protocols underneath the technology underneath and the interfaces with uh, let's say uh, different entities itself, I think uh, there are there are let's say trust boundaries and how do you think about trustless uh, type of interactions or permissive, permissionless type of uh, interactions, if you will. And then there are still, I, I would say, you can simply argue for it. there are still, let's say, traditional web two type of uh, interactions that can still take place. So you you almost think that um, you know as as we evolve here, uh, it will be that it will be kind of like that, uh, for lack of a better word, that dual models uh, of mm. interaction, if you will, right? And and a, a lot of it has to do with uh, the the kind of trust boundaries and trust barriers that you have. Um, whether it's with platforms, with the entities, with certain objects like documents, like what uh, the doco is doing itself. So, so that mix itself, I think, lends itself to inf- inform, let's say, whether is it an individuals or organizations, then, you know, make certain decisions around how that interaction should be facilitated by. If it's a blockchain-based type of um, approach, let's say, for example, you know, establishing provenance of a uh, of a vegetable, you know, from from farm to all the way to the supermarket itself, to the table itself, then then perhaps that because it's mm. so many trust boundaries, then perhaps mm. that's the kind of interfacing model and the transactional model that would take place. Yeah. So again, I, I think we are extending a lot of that flexibility um, and options that is going to come up. So it will be really interesting to see some of that and that transparency. Back to your point, uh, that is itself that. Perhaps it's also something that um, you know certain organizations and people and individuals are also craving for as well. I think that kind of information is is really powerful, and it helps um, it helps many people to be able to make certain organization around when they are crossing the trust boundary. What what is what perhaps could be the right interfaces and the technologies to use? Mm-hmm. Yeah, thanks for sharing that insight, uh, Richard. Uh, Lauren, do you have anything to add on on these points as well? Um, yeah, maybe let, let me add a couple of uh, couple of points to to what Richard uh, um, just mentioned. So when I when I meet with Web two company, which to be clear is is where I come from, right? I mean, I I'm I'm now doing Web three and operating in this ecosystem for four years, but you know I'm I'm very traditional, you know, B two B, you know, professional, and and that's what I've done. So when I meet B two B uh, I'm sorry, when I meet Web2 uh, companies, mostly large companies, you know, asking questions about blockchain and Web3 in general, I, I tend to try to explain to them 
the, uh, the result or, or the true benefits of blockchain through um, optimization of friction and, and automation. Uh, so if, if all of you on this call start thinking about everything that in our business world is not automated and requires some level of interaction between different people with minim minimum value added or requires some, some intermediary for no specific reason, but just because the intermediary has been here for a very long time, what um, the promise of Web3 uh, proposes basically decentralizing this process, providing transparency and, and all sorts of other benefits in terms of auditability that will allow this process to become automated and reduce the friction and by such process automate and, and of course increase the speed of the transaction or the speed of the process you're trying to improve. And you can think of this as any of the process you're, you're dealing with. Right? Every time you log in, to one platform or to another platform, every time you're being asked to provide information, every time you need to fill up information or complete information, or every time some set of documents, like uh, Jason mentioned, you know, need to be transferred from one yeah. place to the other or mm. needs to be validated or reviewed by someone. Now, that's one side of the story. The second side of the story is some people believe in the Web3 space that if you start to decentralize, everything should be decentralized, right? So going, going back to how the world of Web3 would look like, the, the reason why I mentioned all these different verticals that exist today and that are operating in Web3 is because they are there, because certain people believe that you know, exchanges and trading should be decentralized and that security should be decentralized mm. and that mm. operating your, infra your infrastructure should be completely decentralized. And I, I'm not sharing my opinion here. I'm just sharing two sides of the, of the, uh, yeah, of yeah, the equation. Yeah. Yeah. When you're a Web2 company, it's obviously very difficult for any large Fortune 500 or Fortune 1000 company to decentralize completely because that's not the nature of the businesses we build in the past century. Those businesses are organized in silo with the hierarchical approach and very defined centralized process and governance mm -hmm. that basically is the model under which we're operating. Mm -hmm. So in the end, five to 10 years from now, you know, I'm not sure how much will be decentralized and how much will be centralized, but it's going to be an interesting ethical and also philosophical debate on yeah. whether Web2 can really decentralize and up to that stage and, and what would be the benefits of this. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm same as you as uh, this argument is has been ongoing and I'm excited to see after this winter is over, what's going to happen? How much do we actually look at? How much regulations as well do we look at? Because I think it's it's really about the balancing. Uh, I think for the last couple of years, 2019 until now, it's been very decentralized. Everything is very right side. So I hope that you know through this uh, evolution, we see a, a much more balanced ecosystem. Now, um, I'm gonna jump a little bit towards uh some of the the uh the points that the the audience has mentioned and the challenges. But before we address that, I would like to hear from Jason first, right, about Dikoto and, and how you guys actually take that technology, the models that you have described, and actually really build this business up. And how do you see that as a, 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 a set of uh, guiding principles for uh, that you can share with the, the audience here today? Jason, please. Sure. So the, I mean, the, found, the founding team of the Doko kind of, ideated the technology built around kind of one of the underlying principles of web to, uh, web three around how you can ensure that data that is yours remains yours and it's data sovereignty whatever you want to call it it's about the kind of what you own as an individual or as a business or organization you should have the power to control that and have ownership of it uh, and when we were when the, or when the company was building the uh, the platform that was really kind of the fundamental piece that kind of went into how we look at treating documents that we work mm. with from, from customers. So we, we don't need to store your document uh, would be kind of the kind of the headline that we would when we're talking to organizations who are looking at using the tech. Traditionally, you would have to hand over ownership of document to have yep. this process take place. Yep. But with Web3 now, we're able to say to companies, we, we don't need to have your document to undertake this business process. And any output that comes from the work that we do with it, all of that will then be available to you for you to validate um, yeah, the business process that's taken place, whether it's an e-signature, whether it's an approval of a document, a purchase order, that should be on you to be able to then 
kind of provide that document to whoever you want to, and they should be able to access that evidence trail themselves. So mm-hmm. it's, as Richard mentioned, it's that trustless, permissionless kind of idea, but making that real for organizations. Um, mm-hmm. And kind of the way that we we look at it is that we're not trying to kind of change everything. We're not trying to put every document we work with on a blockchain. Yeah. We're just looking at the, the fundamental pieces that are needed for these business processes to take place. Mm-hmm. So to, uh, to Lauren's point about kind of automation, about how do we make it frictionless? The only way that we believe that can be done is, is through allowing the verification process to be out of our hands, that they don't have to come to us as a trusted third party to say who signed this document. It can be done publicly. Uh, mm-hmm. For us, that's, I mean, a lot of the industries we work in are regulated. So the, the data in documents is obviously super sensitive, but the evidence trail really is the piece which when you're providing a document to uh, a third party outside of the transaction, traditionally that person wouldn't be able to verify the process that's taken place because they have a PDF document with some kind of long numbers on and a couple of squiggles. And the only way they could check the provenance was by seeing whether it's been tampered with um, kind of physically on the document. That that was all that was available if you're processing through Web2. Mm, mm. But now with blockchain, all of a sudden we can put the evidence trail of that document onto a blockchain, provide the document back to the company untouched and to the parties who are signing. And they can then provide onto their own third parties and they can independently validate what has happened. Um, so yeah, th- th- those kind of guiding principles is something that kind of we believe is the, the value proposition that we bring to, co- uh, to our partners and customers, but it's applicable across industries. It's not just documents, records, certificates. There's yeah. types of kind of your core business processes that rely on yeah, some sort of paperwork that can undertake these sort of processes. Uh, and mm-hmm. it's, it's not sexy, it's not Bitcoin, it's not all of the fun stuff, which obviously is getting a lot of the attention. Mm. But for companies really looking to get kind of the, the kind of core benefits from the technology, that's where we believe that kind of this bridging between Web 2 and Web 3 is going to be the catalyst yeah. to help a lot of companies um, yeah, transition yeah. towards Web 3. Yeah. Um, uh, be, uh, what, one of the challenges that they mentioned is, um, uh, is complex. The auditing that is very complex to develop a solution like this. I, I don't know whether you could answer this, Jason, but um, on relative terms, do you, do you, how do you d- describe the uh, development of, of this product versus what you have done so far in, in a traditional Web2 world? Um, it's, I mean... Because of the, the technology really is kind of just um, kind of a layer of the technology stack that we utilize. It's, yeah, we, we have to have specialist developers who obviously have blockchain experience. Yeah. But the user experience, kind of the platform that we've built, is still currently accessible through a traditional kind of web browser. It's you log in through traditional methods. Yeah. So the majority of the technology is really still built for people and organizations. So it's close enough to what they've used before. But the blockchain layer is really kind of a, yeah, I mean, it's the key aspect. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. the key aspect, but you don't see it. You don't feel yeah, it. You, you don't have to see it as, as, a, as a user of, of the software as well, right? Exactly. Um, I, I want to bring this question back to Richard and Lauren as well, right? Like, like in, 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 in terms of what you guys have dealt with or seen or heard, it doesn't have to be cases that you, you personally have uh, done. So um, development complexity as, as, a, as one of the, let me see what's the percentage. 30% of them say that this is kind of like the challenge that they're facing today. Um, any word of advice uh, on, on, on that topic? Well, in- yeah, great question. I think that in, in terms of, uh, you know, the, 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 let's say, software development side of it, the, the, the complexity itself, I, I think that that, that approach uh, of kind of starting small and something that, uh, I, I like what Jason said, right? It, it's not sexy stuff. Um, you know, maybe it's documents, it's certificates, but, Frankly, those those are also um, you know let's say personal assets or organization asset itself that is still uh, that is still very important itself. Um, it's it's something that um, at a at a scale itself it's it's bite sized enough for you to kind of solve the let's say provenance and transactional uh, challenges around it. And then that that helps to scope the kind of uh, development complexity, if you will, to do a certain, let's say, acceptable level, if you will. 
right? If if we're trying to solve too much um, to bite off, then of course there's there's way too many con you know consideration and permutations for um, a lot of develop you know a lot of development teams to really you know kind of grok through what what is required here. Mm -hmm. And I think these kind of bite size um, approach will then inform, let's say, later years when we think about some of the developments for um, uh, bigger kind of challenges, if you will, or yeah, yeah. bigger assets. So, yeah. so yeah, love to do it yeah, you know, from a bite-sized approach. I think that's that's always a good way to go, go about doing it. Mm -hmm. Agree on that. Um, I'd love to hear in some insights from Lauren as well. I'm sure you're involved in many of these technologies. Um, what do you think of uh, how complex it is, you know, to build or to adopt some of these uh, Web3 technologies, blockchain technologies into existing businesses? Um, so, so that's an interesting question for, for me. Thank you, because that's obviously what ChainStack does, or at least part of uh, the stack that we've built. is about helping um, the developer community and all these fast-growing companies and projects to basically grow. And uh, we deal with basically all the DevOps and piping um, that is required to run a decentralized infrastructure, which is slightly different um, to quite different from um, a very centralized and, and vertical um, normal infrastructure that you would run on the cloud or outside of the cloud. Um, in reality, the, the Web3 the web um, um, infrastructure is relatively complex because it's not very mature. And mm. it's also evolving very fast because you have a lot of innovation taking place because a lot of money and investment were made in the past five years with technologies mattering at different levels, uh, starting mm. with protocol, right? You have a lot of uh, blockchain protocol. Uh, you have about 40 mainstream uh, blockchain protocol today, right? And you have about 350,000 uh, developer building on these different protocol. Um, I, I'm going to exclude you know, the, the, the typical cryptocurrency uh, that you would find that, that have very limited usage, utility. Uh, from a utility standpoint and, and focus just on those 40 that have a developer ecosystem and trying to uh, basically develop these ecosystems so that they can build application smart contracts on, on top of those 40, right? And uh, the inflow of net new developer uh, coming to this market is also phenomenal. So it, it creates a lot of disruption, a lot of innovation uh, in all directions, right? At every single step of the infrastructure. So the reason why this infrastructure is complex to manage, uh, to start building, I, I use the other another analogy. I'm sorry, that's going to be too analogy today, but I, I go back to 20 years ago. You know, before the cloud was there, if you were a developer, basically you wanted to build an application. Before you build an application, you need to do a few things. You you need to take your car and you need to go to drive in Singapore to Sydney Square and uh, get a PC. And after you would get this PC, you would need to install all sorts of different layer of technology, yeah, yeah. Linux or Microsoft and service packs and then environments and the different language that would en enable you to start building your application. And all this process would take you know, a couple of days to three days to potentially more. And then the cloud came on board. And of course, the ability for you to click on one button and, and generate and provision a specific environment that you can actually build on made it almost instantaneous for developer to build. Now, in the decentralized world, what Chainstack is doing is exactly this, right? You come to Chainstack, you register, and basically we provide you an access either to a full node or an archive node or an API or RPC endpoint that will enable you to connect to the node of the protocol of your choice or multiple protocol and basically run this application. So we're trying to address this particular challenge. And I think today we have over 15,000 active developers on, on the platform on, on, on monthly basis. So I think we, we probably you know, contribute to that uh, within the ecosystem. Yeah, At the same yeah. time, we are only part of the solution, right? <laughs> a lot more needs to be built um, on the security side, uh, obviously, and, and then on everything that you can think of that would make this infrastructure reliable. So in general, uh, I would say that it's relatively complex to build today compared to what it should be mm. for a developer to come and start building. Mm. And I think... We are probably a couple of years ago, couple of years away, sorry, uh, from having a stack and an infrastructure on the major hyperscaler, Azure, GCP, and uh, and AWS, and and basically have a stack which is readily available for developer to come build and scale. Yeah, yeah, right? that's yeah. that's where we are today. Yeah, so so 
yeah, uh, complex. But the thing is that we are uh, like what Jason has clearly said. We're we're not starting from zero. There's a lot of existing uh literature sure. protocols that you can build on top. Depending on of course what you are trying to do. Um, but there are a lot more and it, it moves a lot faster and I think there's a lot more collaborative efforts in the ecosystem today compared to what you mentioned like 20 years ago where it's a lot of proprietary stuff that you have to buy and you do with other businesses. Um, jumping back to a little bit, just a very quick point from you guys, right? I think we, I, I do want to try to address the talent uh, uh, finding the Web3 developers, blockchain developers uh, 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 matter. I think that is a question that a lot of business owners will have if you really want to start something. Maybe just one quick statement, right? Uh, what's a quick advice for from, from you guys? Uh, uh, maybe we can start with Lauren in finding that uh, a, a team or, or, or a set of uh, uh, skill sets that, that these guys require to build on Web3? Where, where do we find so, this problem, basically? Yeah. So let me be, let me be very quick. And um, so basically, it's a change of mindset. And it happened to me. And I recommend everyone to go through this process. Don't be, don't be too uh, rigid or strict in, in your requirements. Because probably your Web3 developer has got less than five years experience and is less than 30 years old. And, and in fact, you're, you're targeting, and I'm not saying all the, uh, you know, all the Web3 developers are below 30 years old and they're all very young and they don't have experience, but the bulk, because of what happened in the past four or five years, the bulk of those good developers that we see on the platform and we see on projects are basically very young, super energetic, very dynamic. They're Web3 lover and, and they build super fast and they, they have a couple of years of experience and yet they're okay developer. So that, that's where I think you need to focus your effort. I mean, if you're looking for a traditional developer with Web3 experience, it's gonna take mm. you a lot longer. If you try to repurpose your team internally, it's gonna take you a lot longer and it will create a lot more challenges. Yeah, let's thanks for that, Lauren. Quick and uh, very short and concise. Uh, Jason, yeah, we discussed this. Uh, uh, let's hear from you as well. We did, yeah. So, I mean, I think two two bite sized nuggets. One, I, I would probably go even longer than younger than Lauren has mentioned. Younger, wow. Um, and we've found a lot of success with internship programs. Um, and like I said, the, the, the kind of uh, the, the ability for people coming out of universities where there are now specialized courses in the technology they're building with means that people can get up to speed and get to a kind of a, an acceptable level of development standards a lot quicker. So although obviously, yeah, getting people with experience in often cases makes that kind of lead time a bit shorter, we, we are finding that some of the best talent can come through internship programs. And you can get people within a couple of years who are able to come in and have a real kind of yeah, impact on the business, um, even if they're still on the internship program, let alone come uh, yeah, finished it. And secondly, how you recruit. Uh, I've come from a recruitment background, so I've gone through traditional recruitment processes for years. You're probably not going to find the best people putting out traditional ads as you would do before or using agencies. Um, a lot of this is community-based mm -hmm. and the projects that people get excited about is, is shared amongst communities and people's interest a lot of the time will be based upon a project that you're doing rather than them thinking specifically, I want to work for X company. So find those communities, find obviously the protocol you're working with, find ways that you can tap into that developer community and obviously build hype and build kind of awareness of what you're trying to do. And you'll find a lot of that kind of yeah, talent will kind of gravitate towards you rather than you having to come out to the market to find it. Mm. Well, okay. That's interesting. Um, quickly, let's hear from Richard as well. Like, you know what? Microsoft. I think Jason and Lauren is, is so well, yeah. right? It, it's, it's, it's really looking for um, that, tal that, that talent uh, in the community with, um, you know, with a little bit of that uh, hacker mindset, if you will, mm. like mm. They, they are the ones that is going to be, you know, kind of breaking things and then putting things together again. So yeah. I meant that in a good way, um, in, in the sense that uh, because, because a lot of these, a lot of these, you know, protocols and, and um, uh, approaches are still a little bit nascent, I would say, in, in certain ways. Yeah. So it, it requires a very, I would say, it requires a very growth mindset to be able to um, look at this in a very complete, um, completely different way. And, and yeah. just that, that, that whole notion around that, that decentralized um, model and thinking itself also requires um, a lot of uh, a lot of the folks to that like, rethink their approaches when they're when they're yeah. in some of these applications, if you will. Yeah, yeah. I think that's uh, uh, really hearing together with Lauren on 
yeah, kind of rewiring your your mindset a little bit. It's oh, yeah. happened for me and like, wow, this is so different from how we think as a company. Yeah. Uh, 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 and the models are uh, super interesting, but you have to be really interested to say, okay, how do we then work with this new approach for our businesses? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, okay, so thanks for that. Uh, we, we do a little bit for the talent side, but we really got to jump to the questions. I really want to answer some of these questions. Uh, I think a key one that they, they were talking about, so there was one that, um, that really talked about challenge. Uh, we addressed quite a fair bit of uh, the challenger side on the technical side, but I, I want to hear a bit of setbacks. Like what are some of the pitfalls that, that they need to uh, take note of, right? Uh, maybe you can start with Jason on this like. Uh, if if you are aware, right? What are some of the things they need to look out for when they are when they are uh, adapting, building, uh, for Web three? Um, I mean, I think I think from kind of a, a business to business level, or in business or B two C B two B, to go into a Web three project or start to roll out a Web three initiative, the, the the starting point has to work with your partners and work with your customers to understand is the benefit that you're going to be delivering through the technology. Does it yeah. work for them? And is it something that's actually needed? And I think a lot of that is obviously taking place where companies kind of just feel like they have to adopt a certain technology mm. just so they can keep pace. So mm. they'll issue uh, a Microsoft NFT because everyone else is issuing one. But really, does the Microsoft ecosystem and the customers, is that valuable to them? And it's yeah. different industries. There's obviously yeah, different kind of desires and different use cases. But for us, it's all about kind of speaking to, from a B2B perspective, speaking to customers and partners to understand, is it really going to be actually valuable to them? And then if it is, that's the starting point, rather than kind of taking something and trying to shoehorn it in because we believe that it's something that needs to happen. Yeah. Um, and I guess, yeah, secondary, I mean, I've kind of touched on it, but kind of expand a little bit on it is is really don't kind of companies think that it's an all or nothing kind of movement towards Web3. Uh, and it's, I guess, a lot of companies who, especially if you're looking or working with external consultants, the kind of the, the tendency is obviously to try and kind of think of as many different use cases for your business as possible. And I mean, I, th- I think a lot of that work can be done internally by looking at your own processes. Where would this benefit? Where would understanding provenance and verifiability, where is it useful yeah, to you? Yeah. Yeah, is it adding in different payment methods? Is it kind of yeah different marketing strategies based upon communities? Figure that out yourself first, and go in kind of educated to these conversations and discussions, mm. because you will find a way to kind of fi- put this technology into your business, but it might not get you the returns or the benefits that you really need uh, to obviously innovate. Um, mm. Yeah, in a productive way. Yeah. Okay. So I hear you. So um, don't don't see it as a technology that you have to apply, but really putting your community or users, your customer first, the HO saying, right? Uh, talk to them, have conversations, but knowing what the technology can bring to them and then weighing that balance. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, Elon Musk is a perfect example. He rolls out Bitcoin payments and within 24 hours, he has to repeal it because the community at Tesla don't believe that it's energy efficient enough to be adopted. So yeah. I mean, it's quite, quite a dramatic example, but it's just the perfect case where somebody has a belief in a certain technology and they think that because they believe in it, that it will be adopted. And yeah, yeah, yeah the, customer, the customer is king. Yeah. Uh, any any points to add on on, on this, uh, Richard or Lauren? Uh, pitfalls and setbacks that they need to just be mindful about. Mm, yeah, I guess uh, from my perspective, it's it's really like the 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 scale and scope of uh, the the let's say challenge that uh, you're trying to address. I think uh, if it's something that's too big to bite off and there's you know a lot of chains in the way, if you will, um, is it, is gonna is it, gonna is it, gonna like push push back a lot of the let's say whether it's a development world before you see any specific benefits itself. So uh, I, I think that scale and scope, it's always something that uh, it's, it's a big consideration so that um, you you see some, let's say, early success and some benefits first before you, you know, try and take on something that's even bigger. Yeah, the, like what you said before, really look at that bite-sized problem and try to solve it well, like what uh, Jason has uh, mentioned as well. Okay. La- Lauren? Yep. Well, I mean, very briefly, because I think we're running out of time. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, I say I say we're not in 2017 anymore, and a lot of work has been done. So, you know, the, the advice I would give anyone, anyone interested in Web3 or anyone in Web2, is to basically look at all those uh, successful and also failing 
um, project and ideas that actually were implemented in the past five years. You you have a lot to learn from the current market condition. Mm-hmm. The market is um, uh, mature enough from that standpoint. Uh, you can get good reports. You can get um, good homework, and you can do good research on on you know on the web as it is before it would become web three, and um, and see what's being done. Chances are the project you're interested in, the decentralization ID that you're trying to implement has been touched or something around has been already thought about. Mm-hmm. And and I think that's where we are today. So I encourage everyone to inform itself and 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 basically do good research uh, around the ID. And then of course, implementation is relatively easy and possible now in short term, right? I mean, mm-hmm. you can build um, simple smart contracts and try uh, simple processes within a matter of weeks, right? So I, I think you can you can really um, have a good grasp as a technology by understanding the market, doing your own research, and and basically trying out uh, good ideas that have been done or improving them. Mm, 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 mm. Okay, so kind of like learning from history and and just be spending a bit more time in the research and insights part. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think I mean just to co- I'm sorry to cut you, but uh, basically you have about forty thousand software company building on Web3 today. Some of them are very small. They're one guy, you know, in a garage. And uh, and some of them are, of course, much larger. But you have 40,000 company building today. Probably mm-hmm. 20,000 of them are reasonably okay. And probably a few thousand are kind of amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that actually answers one, one of the, the open questions as well, uh, whether Web3 is some sort of a hype. Um, we we honestly don't don't think so, and with a lot of uh, uh comments and uh, opinions and insights and literature that is really out there. Uh, the last two questions in integrating Web three to the business, I think Jason Jason has shared a little bit on this. Uh, if there's a need to discuss a bit more, I think we can bring this uh, over to email or LinkedIn. Uh, we're going to be doing a little bit of post uh post after this webinar, so we can continue some of the discussion there. Uh, with that. Just one minute over, but I just want to have one last closing statement from you guys. Uh, kind of like a one statement advice. I think Lauren has done that very well at, uh, uh, from his last uh, point, uh, from, but also from Richard and Jason. Uh, one last statement for these guys that has joined us for the last hour. We thank them for their attention uh, as well. But uh, yeah, one word of advice. Uh, uh, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll start there. Um, yeah. I would always say, I mean, with any sort of technology, um, especially kind of whether it's nascent, whether it's not, whether your beliefs that this is kind of a new thing, a fad, whatever it is, it's always about understanding the the benefits and what you will receive from the technology um, and really understanding whether that has a value to you. Um, and I think a lot of kind of, yeah, the traps that a lot of people fall into is kind of following the crowd with certain things, but really make the fundamentals around whether you're going to start to look at technology that is Web3 based is really understand why you're doing it and what benefit the technology can bring. And as a starting point, I think that will then obviously be able to guide you into the areas that where you need to do that research. Mm-hmm. And there, there are a lot of, I mean, everything that you are now getting in Web2, every type of application, there will be a Web3 alternative that will either be available now or coming out soon that they're mm-hmm. developing. Mm-hmm. So it, you, you have to keep up to date with obviously what is kind of taking place within the market, but it's all about really knowing for now kind of the areas that really will make the kind of critical business impact uh, for you and your organization. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Richard, one last statement from you. Totally agree with that. Just be curious and go out there and learn. Um, And and the key thing is, I think, engage with the community. Yeah. Yeah. Very important aspect of it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's uh, something that we all agree community first, right? For the Web3 side. All right. We'll come to the end of the webinar. Thank you, panelists, for your your insights and uh, for the discussion. I'm going to pass the the mic back to Joel. All right, all right. Yeah, so once again, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Thaddeus, for leading the conversation on this one. I think this has been a really wonderful conversation. You know, and then thank you so much as well to our panelists. So we have Jason, Lauren, and Richard. Thank you so much for the very insightful discussion. And I'm sure everyone here learned a lot. I myself have been taking down some notes as well. So, you know, I'm pretty sure everyone here learned on, you know, why we're to why now, you know, top challenges, uh, that they need to be aware of and how they can start mapping Web3 into their business as well. And yes, once again, thank you so much. And of course, uh, this event wouldn't have been possible without our friends from Didoko. So if you want to know more about what Didoko is um, doing and what they are 
you know, currently doing in the Web3 space, you can visit the their website in the chat here. And yeah, so pretty much that this is the end of our webinar. Thank you so much for joining. And as always, we have more of these episodes happening in the future, so stay tuned. So you can find out more about the upcoming ones, as well as other events and programs around the region that you may be keen on joining on at e27.co backslash events or by signing up for an e27 account, you know, to get updated with the daily branches. So once again, you know, thank you so much to our panelists, to our moderator for the very insightful discussion. And to everyone who tuned in, thank you so much for tuning in. This is revolutionizing your business, and this is where you start. Thank you, everyone, and have a great day ahead. Bye-bye.